Hi, my name is Michelle Lewis. Ten years ago, you'd have been lucky to see me run to the end of the road. These days, running is second nature to me. From marathons to park runs to putting my own running group through their paces, you'll often see me in suitably loud attire, getting ready to pound the pavement. And here's a secret. If I can do it, you can too. There's so many wonderful and inspiring stories in the world of running. And not just running, some of my favourite tales involve those who take to their wheelchairs, bikes or simply their own trusty feet in an attempt to get fitter, faster or just have some fun. In this podcast, I'm going to be in conversation with some of the most inspiring and fascinating of these people. Remember, it's your time, your speed, your way. The only person you need to keep up with is yourself. I really need to get in on that intro. I'm Craig Lewis and there's no Michelle Lewis this week. But what we do have is a wonderful Running Tales guest in Martin Lopez. I came across his story while scrolling Twitter. And in a Transformation Tuesday post, he shared two pictures. One is of him in October 2020 in intensive care, having done, quote, zero endurance events ever and suffering badly from the effects of COVID-19. The other, taken in May this year, shows a fit and healthy looking Martin with five medals from ultra runs around his neck and hopefully a hundred mile bit of bling on the way. Sounded like a running tail guest to me, so I called him up and asked him what part running had played in his life prior to October 2020. Well, it was before I started running. I'd never ran until that point. I'd, well, sorry, I never ran. I've always been sporty, but, um, you know, running wasn't something that I did for pleasure it was a bit of a like a punishment for being to training late or you know losing a game you do two or three laps so running wasn't really my thing um I had uh I'd had a couple of years of just sort of bobbing around in the gym and, and, and doing bits and and then I um I caught COVID uh in in sort of late September 2020 had a week at home uh feeling like pretty ill like really ill and then on the sort of on the sixth or seventh day, my wife called the ambulance out because I was just, you know, my temperature was so high I couldn't breathe. I was, I was really, really struggling. Uh, they took me in straight away. Spent um, a one night on the, the sort of normal ward, feeling loads better because they gave me oxygen and, and lots of drugs, and I started eating because I'd been eat, I'd eaten a thing all week. And I'm someone that definitely never loses their appetite, and it, so that was probably the biggest red flag for my wife in terms of how poorly I was and then um they were they kept talking about intensive care and I was like what are you you know what are you talking about this is the best I've felt for a week you know I can I'm eating I'm fine and I think their concern was I was on the maximum oxygen and the most drugs they could they could give me and I wasn't responding I was obviously I plateaued and I, and I wasn't getting any worse but I was still my oxygen levels uh the oxygen in your blood was my blood sorry, the oxygen in my blood was, was pretty low and they were really concerned about it and, and it wasn't improving. Uh, and then in the middle of the night, after I think so, I'd, I'd got there, I'd been maybe 28, 29 hours. In the middle of the night, I, I got whisked off to intensive care, um, which is where I had that um, that big mask on that's on the, uh, on the on the photo there. And I spent about four nights in intensive care, uh, a pretty desolate place at the time. I was the only one that was conscious of about 14, 15 people on the ward. Uh, everyone else was in a respirator. And which means obviously you're, you're sort of unconscious, I suppose, is the right term. But um, yeah, and it was just it was it was pretty pretty horrible in there, really. In that sense, what was amazing was was how brilliant the care was that I received. You sort of man to man marked by the um by the nurses in there who were by your bed sort of twenty four hours, and it was a uh, that that side of things was amazing to see how hard they were working with people that couldn't see how hard they were working. Obviously, I could. I was I was I was awake the whole time. And uh, and yeah, and that was that was where that picture was in that in that moment. And, and at that time, I, I mean, I've got kind of two questions off the back of that. I think the first one I'll ask you is: is you, you said at that point you weren't you hadn't been doing any running previously, but uh, um, you said you were fairly sporty. So were you quite surprised by how how hard you were hit by COVID? Yeah, I mean. I mean, I work, I work in school, so we you know a pretty safe environment. And there was lots of. Um, you know protocols in place to try and keep us safe but obviously you know we were probably in the most live environment sort of throughout the whole thing 
but I don't know. I've always felt not not invincible, but I just don't. I, I don't. I'm not the most sort of precautious of people. And I just thought, you know, if I get COVID, there's a few people that I knew had had it. I thought I'd be okay. Um, and like I say, I'm relatively healthy. I was probably at that time. Well, I was. I was three and a half stone, three stone heavier than I am now. Um, yeah, 20 kilos heavier than I am now, but I, what I didn't feel overweight. I, you know, I was quite like I say, I was. I've always played golf or tennis or you know, just done something, I suppose. And uh, and yeah, so I felt pretty pretty good and strong. Always ate pretty well. I've been vegan for nearly three years now, so I just didn't expect to to for it to get that bad. And even that first week when I was I was ill and it kept getting worse and worse, I just kept thinking that this will this will end soon and I'll start feeling better. But I think the issue was it wasn't. I mean, I don't. I'm not a, a doctor or a scientist, but I had COVID, which obviously was what, what caused me to be ill. But the, the reason why I was very ill is because it caused a blood clot in my lungs, right. which is why it didn't improve. Um, so yeah, so I was I was in intensive care for sort of four or five days, and then when I came out, I had to have um, like blood thinning tablets to, to for about three or four months to make sure that that, that the blood clot didn't come back. And just the second question that, that sort of came into my head was um, was kind of just how it looks pretty serious from that picture, but just how bad was it? How how close even to, to death were you at that point? Well, I mean, when, when I first got in there on that first, like, two in the morning, I felt, like, honestly, really close to death, like, scarily close to it, I suppose. Like, and it's re- it sounds, like, really over the top to say it in that way, and I'm not, uh, like, a sensationalist when it comes to that, and... And the whole time I really just played it down. And up until, you know, when I shared the, the, that post the other day, I sort of, I've forgotten about it because that was a different me when I was ill. And now I feel so healthy that it's, uh, it, feels like a, it feels like it was a different person. But it was really scary. The first, I'd say, 24 hours were frighteningly scary because, I know, you know, if you spoke to the nurses, they would, they would back that up, I think, because I was constantly... Uh, asking about my numbers on you know it was it's like a like a spaceship in intensive care you got all this data around you and I became like the world's leading expert on my vital statistics for while I was in there and I just kept asking about this and noticing what different things made the numbers go up and what made them go down and then you got into a bit of a vicious cycle where I was desperately trying to keep you know but not that I could do too much about it well obviously I could in the end but trying to keep my them um, blood oxygen levels at a certain point uh even with like the maximum oxygen and, and so on and and like slightly moving would knock you down a little bit and then you'd start stressing about the fact that it dropped down and then and it'd just be a vicious circle and and things like going to the toilet which you did in your bed would just would cause you, you your heart rate to rise and then your blood oxygen to drop and when that happens i mean just for perspective i think uh, like a normal person walking around would be at 95 percent um like not for your blood oxygen would be at 95 percent people with i believe that these aren't factual i think this is what I've, it's been a couple of years obviously now 18 months now but you know if you've got copd it might be between 85 and 90 when i went into hospital at home i was at like 84 percent and then whilst in hospital it was at sort of 83 84 percent with with like heaps of oxygen so without that i would have been in big big trouble and I think what what was the most worrying situation was was in that first twenty four hours. I was led to believe that if it didn't start improving within that twenty four hours, that the next step was a ventilator, which was could have been one, two, three, four weeks, months on the ventilator without waking up. And, and obviously, some people, you know, again, I don't want to put too bleak a point on it either. But some people didn't wake up from going in ventilator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was it was really scary. And then if I'm really, you know, to, to sort of end that sort of that that line of thinking after 24 hours i knew i was getting getting better i think after that first full day in there from two in the morning till sort of the next night or maybe the, maybe the, the sort of second morning that i woke up i knew i was getting better i knew that that it was well i knew that it wasn't getting worse anymore and i noticed small improvements and then um that thing that was on my face in that photograph was I forgot the name of it now. It's not called a, the, the first. The first level is called was called CPAP, I believe, and it was something that went up your nose and it was sort of shot water around. It was a, it's, it's the one level up from the normal mask that you see um, on the the wards. Mm. And I completely forgot the name of that one that was on in, in there. But it's like like a Bane mask, and it's it's like ridiculously oppressive. It's the best way to describe it is it's like putting your head out of the 
the car on the motorway when you're driving at sort of 70 miles an hour and it just completely takes just it, it's really intense and it's sort of it claustrophobic on your face and the first time i put it on i lasted about a minute and you sort of start grabbing at it and trying to pull it off because it's really horrible um, and that was on the, the sort of the friday and then i think what saved me was a weekend of incredible premier league football um, <laughs> because on the saturday i just decided that i kind of sort of learned about what, how useful this mask would be and most people were sort of you know doing 20 minutes here and there so the saturday and the sunday i mean just it was the weekend that I think Aston Villa beat Liverpool like 7-1 or something and Tottenham beat Manchester United <laughs> 6 oh, That weekend of, of football when it was in COVID and there was a game on every two hours for Saturday and Sunday, I just sat there in the in my hospital bed with that thing on my face the whole time and only took it off to, to eat with on the, on the basis that I thought that the more I could do, the quicker I would get better. And then Monday morning, I was out of intensive care. Fantastic. And the... The second half of that that tweet you put up was was May 2022. Five fabulous events and hopefully a hundred mile bit of bling on the way. Life changing eighteen months. So when you yeah. came out, I mean, you talk, you talked about football just then, sort of saving your life. Was it yeah. then? Was was it the epiphany that I need to get fitter and I'm going to start running, or did that come a little bit later? Yeah, like like when I, when I got back on the, I was on the ward for about another two days. Then I left hospital. And while I was on there, I was, I was in that, in the ward with people that had all got all different types of illness, but were COVID positive because that's how the hospitals worked at the time. So, you know, different, you know it was generally older, um, older gents that I was in there with, but all, I mean, I'm 39. There was a couple of early fifties and then a couple of right, much older, older gents. And, and it just, it's, this is going to sound like morbid, but, it gave me a, a, like a, an awareness that how I was feeling now, this sort of, you know, very ill, how I had been feeling, this very ill, really, you know, is this going to, how is this going to go kind of feeling, is, is going to come to me in the end at some point, you know, like age is obviously inevitable, ageing is inevitable. Um, and when that happens, there'll be sort of different moments in my life that, you know, it might be, you know, it will, I don't know. I don't know curse myself with anything but I'll get an illness at some point like we all will when we're older and then be in hospital and I just saw the different people around me how it looked as though they'd looked after themselves or not throughout their life and I saw how well they were responding to any kind of treatment yeah. and their outlook on things just seemed different and the major thing was is that the most important thing to me is my, my family my wife and my two boys and I could see those that were struggling badly the strain it was having on their um, loved ones just through like FaceTime and phone calls because there was no no visitors it was just that's all it was and and I just really thought that this is really selfish because obviously they were in a real tough situation I really don't want to be a burden on my family like 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 this this person is because they're struggling so badly so I just thought I'm just going to be as healthy as I possibly can be so that when those moments come the first few will be sort of like little jabs that I can roll with and move on to the next one and you know what I mean? And just be better and stronger for longer, I suppose. And then the second thing is I've got two boys. One's um, 16 now on Friday and the other one is seven. And the 16-year-old uh, has always had me as a young-ish sort of healthy dad to to be competitive with and to sort of, you know, he's starting to be a bit faster, stronger and fitter than me now. But, you know, he's always had that sort of person to, to play with and then compete with and then just measure, just push himself against and my younger one, if I carried on on the path that I was, he probably wouldn't have had that. You know, I'd have been a sort of 50 year old while he was, a, a, you know, 16, 17 year old. And, and he would have had a very old looking and moving kind of dad. So just that was the, the second motivation to make sure that he gets the same support that the older one has had. Completely get that. I think we see a lot of people doing that. What what intrigues me um, now is is you didn't just go out and start by by the look of what you see you didn't go out and just think well i'll do a, a a part run every week or i'll i'll go out and run two or three miles just to keep myself going you've taken this to to extremes haven't you yeah, i have but that all came because of the first two weeks out of hospital so i was told after i came out of hospital I had to go back 13 days later um for some check up checks and when i went back i wanted to you know i'm not i'm not uh, sorry i am competitive very 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 competitive <laughs> but not against other not swam other people but not like when it comes to events and races and those kind of things i just it's just like i want to i want to push myself as much as i possibly can in, in that sense 
And on that 13 days, I wanted to show all of these doctors and nurses that had really looked after me that I was going to smash it out of the park on, on their behalf. You know what I mean? So it started, out, I, was, I was at home, and this is why, this is how well I remember it, and this is how important it's been to the to, to the, what happened after that, mm. is that I had, I, I sort of, I sort of checked myself out of hospital um, because there was someone that died the night before on the ward. And I just knew that I needed to be out of that environment in a place where I'd got maybe some fresh air and I could be in a couple of different spots. So the second I did a morning without oxygen, I then sort of said, look, I, I really want to go home now. And the doctors made sure I was aware of all of the risks of that. And, and I, I, I sort of thought I knew what was, was best for me. And after that first night of having a, a, an okay night's sleep and, and essentially not dying or going back to hospital, I was like super relieved and, yeah. and ready to sort of kick on. Um, and I had about two or three days without doing anything. And on the fourth day, I went for a like a 400 meter walk just around the block with my son. It took me like about half an hour and it was like impossibly hard. I got back and I was just sweating buckets. It was a freezing cold night. It was like late October. Um, and, uh, and and it was just so hard. And then the next day I did a kilometer and then the next day I did a kilometer and I did it quicker. And then the next day I did, I think one and a half kilometers. And then the next day my wife went to work for the first time and trusted, you know, that because I was, you could see I was, I was, I was okay by myself. And I walked 5k, a, a, like a loop around, around the block. It took me like an hour and 20. And then the next day I did it in an hour and 10. And the next day in just over an hour, and then on that fourth day, I sort of told my wife what I'd been doing because she didn't think I'd, she thought I was waiting for her to go for a walk on the night. And I just was out there just walking. And all I did was um, really strictly just followed my heart rate. So if it got above 150, my heart rate, I'd just stop or slow down. And, and that's all it was. It was it was that. And on the, on the sort of 13th or 14th day, I was I was just before I'd gone back to the hospital, which they would have then signed me up to go back to work, which is also important to me because I wanted to get back and just get back into the swing of things as quick as possible. I I think I walked the, the 5k in about like 50 minutes and and it just struck me that wow what like a difference from from 400 meters that honestly was the, the hardest thing I'd ever done 13 days later to walking 5k in 50 minutes and it being relatively easy you know my heart rate never went over 130 um, and then I went to the hospital they, they sort of signed me off and then I just sort of slowly got back into to life I mean I didn't run at all at that point but I think six weeks after because little challenges like this interest me six weeks after I've been checked out from intensive care um I ran a 5k because in my head yeah. it was a bit like a you know couch to 5k like a intensive care to 5k thing you know and in terms of context of my journey that that, that run was maybe a 35 minute 5k run that I did and I found it really really tough and uh, but completing it was 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 cool and then was, was that know, just on your own or was that like a part run or a run with a no just by myself. my son plays yeah my son plays um plays football uh and he, he was playing for Birmingham City at the time and they had Leicester City away and it was I worked out it was two and a half k from the training ground to the stadium and back so I just thought that's a cool and and to be fair that kind of that kind of like motivation on all of my runs is, is what spurs me on to now even like what you know how far can I go and back or how far can I what can I tie into this run kind of thing mm. so so yeah it just interested me and I thought I'm going to go and try and do that and I, and I did it and uh and then it was a couple of weeks later I'd sort of then I was back at the gym and doing the odd little jog here and there just to keep an eye on, on how my lungs were improving because at this point I was still on the, the blood thinning um, medicine and I was still going back to the hospital every every sort of three or four weeks and I was showing them all the data from a watch that to show that they could. I wanted to be sort of signed up in the hospital and and, and clear of that really. And on, on it was literally on on New Year's Eve 2020. I said to my wife, "I'm temp because the gyms had just closed again, so we'd had a bit bit been open for a while. Then it was just shut down again for the whole of January. And I said to my wife, well, I think I want to do a bit of a challenge in January, either a walking or a a running challenge.' And uh, and I was sort of I was leaning towards walking because I could listen to podcasts. I like taking photographs. I could take photos. I could maybe read a little bit while I was walking. And she sort of said, well, you know, you don't really like running. So why don't you try and crack that and, and, and do a bit of running? And I was like, yeah, I know, but it's more difficult. And I'd probably enjoy walking more. And she went, exactly, that's why you should run. 
so that day on on well actually it was yeah so it was on the morning of new year's eve on new year's eve i went for a run around 8k five miles whatever, whatever that is roughly um and that was it and that was my first proper run as a runner in my in my mind and then january it just kind of took off i, I don't know whether i did like because obviously the red january is now a thing and i don't know whether it was then or not but i, I probably yeah. did run nearly every day in that january I did a couple of things that, which which helped us. That was our target of doing a four hour marathon that year, and I, like my New Year's resolution kind of thing. I then set up a Strava group for my work. So I work for a, a big education trust, Invictus Education Trust, and we've got six schools, uh, probably about seven or eight hundred members of staff. So I just sent out a, an all staff email inviting everyone to this January, you know, trait run stroke walking club, and that kind of did two things it added a bit of accountability to sort of you know keep moving and get everyone moving a little bit and be a bit of a you know community leader of, of that group and it also just a bit of a competitiveness each week with different people that were you know we sort of put a challenge out so you could do the most each week or do this or do that and that that month was crucial really because I went from the first couple of weeks not still not really enjoying running it being something that I was doing for a, a purpose and then there was a couple of weeks and I had a bit of a light bulb moment with the, the sort of like the, the notion to just slow down and just enjoy the actual run while I'm running it rather than just running as quick as I possibly can for as long as I can. And then and that changed everything. Like I think within I think the biggest run I did in January was about 28k, which uh, now it's you know I did that I did that Sunday morning just as my, my kind of my, my, my slow easy long run, whereas at that time it felt like wow like i got back home and i couldn't believe how far i'd gone and and what i did yeah but you, even moving up to 28k i mean that you've, you've made that journey pretty quickly once you started um running and it sounds like you have perhaps a slightly sort of uh, uh addictive personality once you get into something that's sports related and 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 are quite competitive with more yourself than other people is that is that perhaps fair yeah 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 like i i love i mean just lately it's more philosophical just about this, this last month or so um <clears throat> i've you know i'm really driven by my numbers and what the numbers are in terms of my kilometers sorry minutes per kilometer and and my heart rate at any one point and, and my speed over a certain distance but it's it's only it really really is it's not about in comparison to it's only about my progression because I think as sports people or athletes or you know people that do sport as a hobby um it's easy to get wrapped up in that from a sporting perspective and and just being you know sort of and there's nothing wrong with that because people that have grown up as a runner like I've grown up playing football or tennis or golf or any other sport it's important because you've got a really acute understanding of your community and the level you're at within that community whereas and runners will have the same, but but for me, because my numbers in the in in the short term were about like survival, it's still like the same. It has the same meaning to me that it's it's not about now survival. It's about actually thriving, and I just love it's so motivating to, for me to know that wow, I'm moving at this speed, and it's so, it's so easy. You know, I'm, my heart rate down at at like one twenty eight, and and that's that's amazing. And and also it helps me understand like like today I woke up with a little bit of a cold, and the run this morning was a little bit of a struggle, but. I'm okay with that because I know there's a like a mitigating factor with it so so yeah so there is a bit of oh well, yeah there's definitely it's, it's like an obsession it, it, with with something that I just you know I sort of get into something and and I find it hard to put down I suppose but yeah as I think as long as you're enjoying it and it's um it's not too harmful then so be it yeah definitely so so you 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 caught the running bug in that month how far along has that has that bug taken you tell us a little bit about some of the events and yeah. some of the challenges you've done since then so obviously the first goal was the marathon and i think i did that in about march that was for, that was the year goal it was just by myself which went out and ran like a there and back on the canal and um and yeah and and then while i was doing that because of this community that i developed through my workplace uh, a couple of guys there were really into triathlon and one of them was um it, it, to be fair he's doing it this year Tembi Ironman Tembi it's been cancelled twice but that was his big goal yeah. and he sort of urged me to to have a little go at triathlon and then before before I'd, before I knew how to swim I mean I could swim like as in I, I, I can't I didn't drown when I went in the pool but I couldn't swim with my head underwater or do any kind of technical stroke and um, I signed up for uh, the half it's not a, it wasn't an Ironman event, but it was a half Ironman distance event in the June. 
So this was just after I finished the marathon. And then I sort of learned how to swim as quick as I possibly could. And then I went open water swimming, which was like, horrifying. Um, but anyway, I mean, I, I did all the training for the triathlon, got a bike. It was just like classic, the sort of everything, you know, every, anyone that knows me, like friends at work or friends generally, just like, oh, this is classic. You know, this is, this is you all over, just all in, all or nothing kind of thing. <laughs> um, and I did, I did the, I mean, even, even the Ironman, the, the, the triathlon, I had this like stupid target of doing it in under six hours, which was pretty unachievable because at that point, my fastest half marathon ever would have been about like 155. And I'd never gone under sort of three hours for the bike part and the swim could have took me anything up to an hour, but I was just like, you know, on the day, the sort of like the, the rush of everyone doing everything together will get me to, and they ended up coming in at like five hours 57. But, and it, and it was like on the morning of it, I kept thinking, oh, what if I don't do it under six hours? And you start thinking, nobody cares, like nobody other than me. <laughs> I've, not, I've not said to anybody uh, anywhere, this is the most important thing that I do in under six hours. But on the day, I was starting to feel nervous for it. And I don't know whether that's a bit of a, a defense mechanism to stop me worrying about finishing and just have me focused on a target rather than rather than the target being, let's just get through this. It's let's get get to this point. But yeah. I, I think it's a strange thing we, we we all sort of do when we when we enter any of these events and we think I'm going to try and do a, a half marathon in this time or a marathon in that time. And we, we sort of make it the most important thing in the world just to help ourselves yeah. get through it. And that last six yeah. months of the marathon say, and, and, and then and then we realize at the end that, that Maybe apart from our family and close friends, <laughs> nobody could care less whether you did a marathon yeah. in three, oh, three thirty yeah. or seven yeah, thirty. Not, <laughs> not even my family or close friends care. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, no, they, I mean they do. They've been so supportive. Just, that's a joke, obviously. But yeah, um, and so I did that. Really enjoyed it. But the, you know, the amount that I like exercising, the the swimming and the cycling just I wouldn't say stressed me out a little bit but trying to fit it all in was just quite difficult and truthfully running was the bit that I really I, at this point I just loved it I just loved it so much I loved the, the thought of things like you know if, if we go on holiday it's really easy just to, to just chuck a pair of trainers on and go for a run whereas to try you know to go on holiday and try and continue with triathlon training you've got to somehow get a bike on the top of your car and take your wetsuit and then dry that every time you've used it and it just it just became like it was more of a it was more competitive and metric based and less the actual event itself even and less sort of like free spirit and even a bit so I'd say it, it goes to in my opinion like this you've got the triathlon community then the road running community then the trail running community and the trail running community is just like it's just like a, a buffet on the move when you go for a sort of ultra run you're just sort of running to the next all you can eat buffet station um, <laughs> and it's less serious and more like fun, fun based and um, and then running is sort of a bit more hardcore and about where you're you know where, where your time is and, and where you're finishing in the race and so on and triathlon was like one one even further along it felt and that's probably really unfair on all those communities but that's my my experience of it and my take on them and then so, so i decided to park the triathlon and because I'd sort of achieved my marathon thing, I thought the only sensible thing to do was sign up for a 50 mile uh, race. And then, <laughs> See, yeah, I, can, I, I can hear people people um, listening to this sort of thinking in their head or even shouting out loud, sensible, <laughs> sensible. Yeah, I know, I know. Well, because I just, I'd got, I mean, I've just had, again, 18 months in, I've had this moment where I'm thinking like, what's next? And I've, I've just had a bit more of a, a more actual sensible suggestion for where I'll go next but but yeah it just seemed like natural you know I've, I've done the, the the marathon thing um I'll just try this I enjoyed being out sort of six seven hours or six hours on the, the triathlon and this is taking me to the, the next step I think oh but uh, yeah so because I think sorry just before my, my my first initial goal was this this year now that we're in 2022 which is the year before I'm 40 was to do a, a full Ironman once I've signed up for that triathlon and then when I sort of thought the triathlon, maybe I don't enjoy it as much as, as I do the running, it then changed to doing a 100 miler. So the 50 miler was done with, with that in mind as being, you know, ever since that moment, I've just tried to put myself outside for longer and longer to get to the point where I'm going to be out there for sort of 30, 35, 40 hours, maybe. Uh, so that's kind of the, the, the rough theory behind it. So I did the 50 miler and um, it was 
unbelievably enjoyable. I mean, not easy, not the right word, but I, I just bumped into this, this guy on the start line and ended up chatting away to him for like five hours. Obviously, my name's Martin Lopez. His name was Max Lopez. His dad was Spanish. My dad's Chilean. He'd spent, I think he said, four years working in this small Chilean town that, that my family are from um, training horses. So, and he was like a year younger than me, just had, a, you know, both dads. He was just like he was put there to purposefully make my event an absolute dream. So we just chatted away for five or six hours, had a great time, which meant obviously it was really easy running. And then I just kicked on a little bit towards the end and, um, and yeah, and finished it. I finished sixth out of, I think, 40 in the event and just had a, a brilliant day. Like I didn't know that I'd finished sixth because it was a staggered COVID start. So, um, you know, the, the, everyone went up in, in waves kind of thing. Um, and, and it wasn't that the sixth was important to me, but it was just a really cool, cool day out and a really enjoyable experience. It was in, in Salisbury on the, the tank tracks and, and stuff. So, you know, nice scenery. And then... Oh, what other events have I done? So I did a, my own sort of 50 miler over Christmas. I did a self-supported uh, run around our six schools for a, a charity. Now that I found that really tough because the, the 50 miles and the aid stations on, on big races obviously are really helpful. So I tried to carry everything that I needed with me and, and ultimately I didn't take enough stuff. And it was just a bit of a, a bit of a, a battle to get through that. Um, I held an FKT for a little while, um, and I'm going to get it back. Is that, have you have you heard of the fastest known time website? Uh, no, well I haven't, but I bet some of our listeners have. But uh, yeah, talk, yeah. talk through it. Yeah, well, uh, fastest known time. I think it's an American company, so there's just routes that you, anyone could make. So there's a, there's a few sort of stipulations about the routes that they're generally like like well known paths and 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 or rounds. So um, there's uh, probably the most famous in, in in England is the Paddy, the Bob Graham round, sorry, which is all the tops in you know, forty two or forty. I'm gonna get that wrong, but forty odd. It, it sounds like a it sounds like a proper runner's version of being a Strava legend. Yeah, yeah. So the Strava <laughs> segments, it's that, but they're just they're just well known paths like Monarchs Way or the Staffordshire Way or the South Downs, you know, that that kind of stuff. Um, and the person that's that's done it the fastest gets their name on this this website. And there's there's only a couple in I live in the Midlands. There's only a couple, and one of them is called the Wolverhampton Ring. So I went out on the anniversary of my starting running on the 30th, the 31st of December, just the, you know the Christmas, the New Year's Eve just gone. And I I did the, the FKT for that that um that route. Um, some so and so stole it off me since, but I'm gonna go get it back in a few weeks time but it's just a cool little thing you know it's just a, a cool little present to myself on there uh, on my, <laughs> my running anniversary how sad does that sound um and then and then on the build up to my, my 100 i've just entered a couple of events recently i did a, a 41 miler across the millennium way which is a path from one side of staffordshire to the other so it's from newport in shropshire to burton which is derbyshire uh that was in april and then just last weekend, I did an event called Back in 10 Minutes, which is 42 miles on um, on the Long Mind, which it was really hilly. It was like 3,000, nearly 3,000 metres of ascent. And that was obviously geared towards the fact that I've got a very hilly 100 miler coming up at the, in the Brecon Beacons. Uh, so when is the when's the hundred meter coming? Hundred hundred meters, hundred miler coming up. When's it due? Uh, twenty the twenty third of July. So not far off at all. Are you uh, you yeah, feeling confident? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I do. So the company GB Ultras have organised um, two recce weekends where you do on the Saturday we did the first quarter, the Sunday the second quarter, and then a month later we did the third quarter and the fourth quarter. And after I finished the the recce, which were only like a month ago, um, I don't know. I had a bit of a, a like a, an internal wobble. I just thought. It's going to take me about 35 hours. It's really hilly. There's, there's, you know, it's, it's a slow moving 100 mile. Of I didn't know anything about it when I went. I just thought it sounded like a cool, a cool thing in the mountains. I'd watched too many American trail running YouTube videos and just thought, yeah, that's me. I'll, I'll do that. Um, and it, in hindsight, I don't think I'd have entered it if I'd have known how difficult mountains were to run up and down. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, it was, um, it was a bit just, it just felt like I, when I when I completed all four of the records, I just thought I'm, I just I'm not going to stitch all that together and do it all in one go. Um, and then I think when I did the third and fourth record, I had a really heavy week of running 
the week up to it. So I'd, I'd gone into that weekend pretty fatigued. Um, didn't have, we, I camped for the first time, I think in about 20 years on, on the, the Friday and the Saturday. So I didn't sleep that well. And then on the Sunday, my son actually broke his ankle at the start of the run. So I, I was sort of running with that in my mind because he broke his ankle on a football pitch in Lincoln. And I was in Brecon and I had that sort of like conflict of why, you know, why am I here? You know, mm. in Wales and my family are miles away and now they're, they've got to go to a hospital and blah, blah, blah. So it kind of really like, it gave me a bit of a wobble as to what, I was, what, what was I doing and, you know, why was I doing this? And it's going to be really hard anyway, like, and so on. So, um, which I think was probably just down to like exhaustion for lack of sleep and, and, a, and a real heavy week. And then obviously I got back and spoke to my wife, my son was okay, he's, he's recovering now and, um, and like, yeah her words were it was literally nothing that could have been different if you were here it would have been the same we didn't know it was broken we took him to hospital afterwards and it was broken but you know that that's it really it's uh it's one of those things and just sort of gave me a bit of a shake and said you know you've done nothing which talk about this if you don't do it now then i'm gonna kick you out the uh the house kind of thing <laughs> so <laughs> so yeah and and that was i mean it was never like i really thought i wasn't going to do this i just thought why you know why am i doing this um because it's going to be tough and and there's more important things so I've got nothing to prove sort of thing. This is this is uh, something I've created myself. Um, and that lasted like a day or so. And then, and then I don't know, since then, I've just had some really good runs. That, that The event a couple of weeks ago, the really hilly one, went really well again. It almost sort of finished. In, I think there's, I forgot the number of people that run it now, but there's quite a few. And I, I just, just finished shy of top 10 in that event. But more importantly, just found it really comfortable. The whole day was super enjoyable. There was no struggle. And yeah, and I'm just, uh, just, I feel ready. I feel really fit and healthy. I feel like I've got another seven or eight weeks left. Well, no, probably about another five weeks of serious training and then three weeks of tapering down a little bit, ready for the event. We'll assume the 100 miler goes uh, goes perfectly well and you you enjoy it and get through injury free and uh, in, in a comfortable time. Uh, what What's next after that? Well, I don't, I don't know exactly, but what, what I thought naturally was going to happen was, was that I was going to progress to you know, maybe another hundred miler or another, another you know, a couple a couple of hundred milers, but then to like a multi-day kind of race. There's a couple like famous ones in in the UK, like the Dragon's Back, being one. It's I think five or six days through the, the whole of Wales, um, or like a, a major coastal path attempt. But I just feel like that um, those kind of things can wait because I just think that. The training for those just takes you you out for so much, so many you know long long days and and big training efforts. And as much as uh, I, I I love it, I just think that I've got a youngish family and there's I, I can't afford to spend more time than I do now. So how I fit in most of my training is is before everyone gets up. So I'd say seventy percent of my running's done while while my wife and the kids are, are asleep. Um, but obviously, when when you're training for these massive efforts, there are days where you just need to go and do a six, seven hour one. And and for a multi day one, I'd need to to practice doing that day after day. So I think maybe that's something that will probably wait till I'm a, a bit a bit later in life and when the kids are grown up, maybe. Um, so I'm really not sure at the minute, and I, I really like the fact that I'm not sure because I do like sort of following a little path for a little while. It'll be, I mean, what is for a fact? It'll be running of some some description. It's not that I'm gonna fall out of, of love with running it's just that it could be at the moment I'm going down the line of, of looking for like a series of 50k trail race kind of things and make that my my goal for sort of 2023 is do a, a number of those and having said all of that there's a guy that that's going to support me for the last 50 miles of the 100 miler who's got a, a lifelong ambition of doing the, the Bob Graham round which is the, the Lake District one you have to do all of the the, the, the tops in there the mountains in there within 24 hours to get your name on this pretty prestigious board so he's he wants to do that in may next year and and as a, a you know a return the favor for helping me out in, in july i'd probably feel inclined to to do that i mean it's no it's, it's like a really you know great thing to do to go and do it but um yeah. that that could probably be one of the things but yeah i think maybe picking a distance um a bit shorter than 100 miles and making that my, my race distance for a while and just seeing how, just exploring it a little bit and seeing how, how I can get on with it. Um, that's probably the, the next thing, really, I think. And is that potentially a, a, a marathon distance or, or maybe something a bit longer than that? 
Uh, well, I just I think anything in between. So so marathons forty forty two k. Um, fifty k is a is a, is sort of a recognised trail distance, I suppose. But anything from from fifty k to seventy k, I think it's it can be done in you know the event itself is then done in in you know between five and and eight hours depends on on the terrain and all the training for it is is no longer than sort of four or five hours so that's more that's more what's going to guide my decisions but yeah um I, I don't think like road marathons i did manchester last year and mainly because again similar to the the uh the, the triathlon i just set myself a target of right you know if i don't do this in three and a half hours the whole thing's a waste of time and I, I it was the most unenjoyable run i can't remember a thing about the route the, the, the at all because I pushed myself so hard to try and get three and a half hours and I think I got three hours 29 and 11 seconds or something and and I, I mean I literally can't remember the, the towns we went through or anything like that I was just pushing the whole time which is that's not about road running that's about my reaction to to, to being on, on, on a road run and a road marathon so I I just enjoy the the views of the, the trails and the, the you know the mountainy ones and the different terrain and I love downhills uh, but sorry that's probably the biggest thing to say I've got a massive passion for running downhills which sounds obvious but I mean like proper, <laughs> like that like gnarly technical downhills I just I, I love them everyone that I run with seems to comment about how quick I can get down them so um I think that's something that I could explore a little bit more and, and I just I find it so exhilarating a bit like I suppose how mountain bikers why they why they do what they do downhill mountain bikers and skiers and those kind of things you know, getting to the top is, is a bit tough, but coming down the other side is just so, so much fun. I, I haven't had a fall yet, so I'm sure that once I've had my first serious I'll fall... I'll put you off a bit. Yeah, put me off a bit, but at the moment, I just... I, that's, that's probably the driving thing when it comes to trail running is the, the downhill parts. I just love them so much, so much fun. And, and I've spoken to other trail runners and ultra runners in the past, and uh, and one thing they'll say about it is, you know, if you're doing... 50 miles 100 miles or whatever like that you, you, you your body you're not going to go flat out for the whole distance like you were saying you might do with your uh your marathon so in in yeah. some ways bizarrely when you're talking about those crazy distances it can always be a more uh enjoyable more relaxing run in a way like 100 like exactly that i mean i i do it all on my heart rate so if i'm on a 100 mile i just don't let my heart rate go above 140 which means obviously when I'm going up a hill, I will I'll run until my heart rate gets to 140 and then I'll let it drop down to 130 and so I have a little jog again. I think a lot of people who do the, the longer ultra runs, they've got, there's, a, there's a sort of a, a general rule of thumb that you run the flats and the downhills and walk the uphills. But I think that I, I just go, and that, that's the case for steep uphills, but for, for steady inclines, you can jog those and, and still, still keep your heart rate quite low. But, you know, I where where I am with my training at the moment, that's where, where I am. So so yeah, that, and that, and it's it's true. It is just so enjoyable, and the, the the different people that you meet, and it's like the, the thing about being competitive. The events that aren't why I do it. I think the events like give me something to train towards a, a little bit, but I don't get too much. I mean, all the events I've done this year so far, the two that that just happened, they they were essentially training runs. I went into them with no desire to push really hard. It was. The, the 41 miles Millennium Way was on the Sunday of um, a national run to work week for teachers and school staff. And um, so I ran a, I live a half marathon commute away from work along a canal. It's just over a half marathon. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I run there and back every day. So I did a, just over a marathon every day, as well as the work day. Then Thursday, I ran in and got a lift home. And then Friday, I got a lift in and ran home. So over the course of five days, I ran four marathons and had a day off on Saturday and then ran the, the 41 miler on Sunday. And the, the aim of that was, was to give myself a huge volume week. I think it was 160 miles for the week, just to put myself under either the race. So, so the race would have felt more like what maybe halfway through the 50 miler, the 100 miler will feel um, to try and create that situation without obviously going out that many miles. So it's just... Um, I just find it interesting and you know the, the speed in which you you uh you, how hard you push yourself just you know if you don't push yourself too hard it can be really enjoyable 
Definitely. And, and I just had one last question, which comes back to sort of where we started. Presumably, this far into your journey, you, you must be feeling, a, even before you had COVID, a lot more fitter, a lot healthier, and just a lot better generally because of the love of running you found. Yeah, I've, I said to him, well, I said it about a year ago now, but I've just, I've never, ever been so, so happy, and so fulfilled. Um, and it's, I think it's, it's a number of reasons. So um, when you're running, you obviously get so much time to think. And, and it's like, a, it's such a cliche, but I mean, in the sense of, of like relaxing your mind by, by, I don't know, thinking this, I suppose when you're busy, you look for distraction away from the things that you don't want to think about. So, you know, the stress of this or the stress of that, whereas running, there's, there's no point in pushing it to the back of your mind because it, all you've got is time to think. And I think that, that that's like a, a form of meditation in a way, in the sense that like meditation is just is just turning your mind towards something that, that you're not comfortable with and, and sort of exploring it a little bit and seeing where that takes you. And I think running allows me to do that. It then has helped me feel better in my, my body. You know, I've, I've lost, like I say, about three or four stone, which is, you know, it's not important from a, you know, a, a, aesthetically in terms of a health perspective, but it does feel good to, to know that you look better health-wise. Um, yeah, it's just, it's, I, I mean, the reasons for running for me are like endless. And that's why I know that there's, there's a, there's times, you know, where I've been like really enthusiastic about golf or about tennis or about, you know, whatever it is. But this is, I think running is something that I will do right for the rest of my life because of how, how good it's made me feel and how, and how happy I am, I suppose, and fulfilled as a, as a person, really. Oh, fantastic. Well, that, that seems like a, a really perfect uh, place to end. So, Martin, thank you so much for your time. Good luck with the 100 miler. We'll, uh, we'll certainly keep our eyes out and see how you get on with that one. And um, I appreciate you, buddy. Thanks so much. No, thank you, mate. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate it.